all that you've done for me. Oh, 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 oh.
would you just listen to the hearts of your people tonight as we continue in worship with you. Let this be a receiving and giving and pleasing sacrifice to you. Jesus, what a joy to be here tonight, to enter into the sanctuary and present ourselves to you, flaws and all, wrong thinking, words we shouldn't have released, thoughts unworthy of you, we do things we ought not to. We miss opportunities to share our faith. We can be downright selfish and mean sometimes. And yet we come confidently into the sanctuary because first of all, we want to lay all of that at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, I'm sorry that sin still reigns in my mortal body. And I ask that you would forgive it all that you would wipe it away so that I'm not selfish and I'm not mean and I'm, I'm not saying and thinking and doing the wrong stuff, but that you would have access to my head and my heart and my life. Come, Lord. Let 
your Holy Spirit rest upon us. And as we place all this at the foot of the cross, we seek to be filled by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Come in and take away the worry and the doubt and the anger, the contrary desires. Take away the weariness that so many of us feel, weariness from ministry or relationships or past pains or chronic body pain or chronic bad habits, bad thinking, stuff that we've been carrying with us forever and we actually know that we can hand it to you but for some reason we don't. Tonight, we want to move it into your presence and say no more. I don't want to be dominated by that any longer. I want to be under the yoke of Jesus Christ that's easy and light. Lord, as we give all this to you, we, we also want to say thank you. Because not only do we come with all that stuff, we come with answered prayers. We've come with hope that tomorrow's going to be different because we know you are part of our lives. We know that you can release healing and mend relationships. We've seen you do it. We know you can continue to do it. Even if we don't know what's in store for us, we know that walking hand in hand with you is going to bring about a great plan, your plan. The privileges of being a child of God. Thank you, Lord, for protection that we're unaware of, for kindness that we didn't realize we needed, the grace and mercy that we take advantage of, a God that allows himself to be taken advantage of. Well, you are the most incredibly kind and wonderful Lord. But we don't want to take advantage of you. We want to treat you the way we're supposed to. We want to honor you and bring a smile to your heart and be about the family business of bringing other people to know you. Please, Lord, let a transformation occur in all of us if it's just one relationship that we step into on your behalf, if it's taking on a ministry, if it's starting a mission, launching into a building campaign, something big or something small like saying, Lord, I'm not going to let this fear bother me anymore. I'm going to decide to trust you. Let there be an empowerment And gracious God, you can't help but smile thinking about the opportunity to talk with you every day, to lay out our problems, to dream with you, to pray for others, to watch you come off the, the page of the Bible or the devotional book and, and speak into our lives. You are a living God. And that's why we're here tonight, to engage you. So wherever we are on that spiritual journey this evening, we take a quiet, personal moment right now to speak to, connect with, confess to our living God.
Lord, it's spectacular to know that you hear us. You answer every prayer. You take us seriously. We take you seriously. We're here to say thank you for your grace. Thank you for your relationship with us. We step into that adventure of faith together. In the name above all names we pray, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, let's stand and greet one another. Uh, what a joy to be here with you tonight. Hey, you know, we have kind of a, two themes going on tonight. We're going to continue on in our conversation about those after-resurrection events that took place in the Bible. But before we jump into that, <clears throat> this is a big weekend for our church. You know, if you were talking about big weekends, this is a big one because we are launching our, cap celebrating our capital campaign uh, we've, we've been quietly just going about uh, asking people to, to give, and many of you have given already, and you know what, I, I just want you to know it's a big number. You've already given $1.1 million to the, the, to the new campaign, okay? So just huge to see the way God has been moving on people's hearts and saying, yeah, I know we need that building. Uh, I know it's going to cause more people to come to, to have a relationship with Jesus. It's expensive when you live in celebration, but um, this is where we live, and God is our resource, and you know what? It's, it's, it's special for me to, to know that 
the congregation is, is committed to this project. And if you haven't had an opportunity to give, we're going to have outside on the tables um, some pledge cards. And it's an opportunity to say, okay, I want to be part of this too. It's a three-year plan. So you might say, well, I can't do anything in 2016, 2017, 2018. Um, but, you know, we're not a church that squeezes you for money. We do squeeze you to, to let Jesus come oozing out of your life. We want that from you. We want Jesus oozing into your life. We want that for you. And, and part of our problem, part of our opportunity, our vision is, is to see, you know, our, our facility get expanded so that we have plenty of room for our programs, more opportunities for kids, adults, everybody in between to, to have a relationship with Jesus. So um, <clears throat> if you feel like giving, we need you to, we want you to. Um, otherwise, I'll have to excommunicate you from the church, okay? <laughs> so um, it's a little joke. So, I'm, I don't, you know, it's just more of a celebration that what you've already done. I, I'm just so excited, so surprised, so pleased, humbled to belong to a, a church family like you. So uh, don't miss out on the blessings of, of building his kingdom here, okay? Well, it's time for us to, to do a little <clears throat> work in the scriptures. On, and we're going to be working out of, out of John chapter 21. There are 24 verses, and so why don't we just take the time to read it. <clears throat> Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. And early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And he called out to them, friends, have you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your nets on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him and he jumped into the water. And the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said, bring the fish to me. And Simon Peter climbed aboard, dragged the net ashore. It was full of fish. 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said, come have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. Now this is the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. A third time he said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And I'm going to stop right here. This is the third time that Peter gets to interact with Jesus. Now I realize he's seen him two times already, the resurrected Lord. And somewhere during this time period, Jesus has also been seen by 500 people. So Jesus is making the rounds. And in spite of Peter having personal exposure to Jesus, he's going fishing. And what scholars think is this statement, I'm going fishing, it's not merely an afternoon outing. It's more of a statement. 
that I'm going back to my old ways. It's the first step away from his calling as a disciple and back to his old lifestyle. He's basically not going to be a disciple anymore. Why? Well, Peter must have felt horrible following the denial of his Lord. I mean, can you imagine the guilt and the anguish that he felt multiple times a day, every day? Have you ever had that experience where you did something wrong and it comes to mind many, many times for many days upon weeks upon months? Sometimes it can last for years if you don't deal with it. I mean, I could see Peter thinking, everything I'd promised him just added to my shame. When it came to choices, I denied I knew his name. And even if he's alive, it won't be the same. He's messed up the relationship. In his mind, it's a permanent problem. And and guilt hanging heavy on his shoulders. Peter feels disqualified from seeking and serving the Lord. What's left for me except to go back to my previous life? And I'm guessing that many of us have had this experience of failure. Interrupt our our journey with Jesus. and, And it's hard to deal with. I remember hearing about this one guy, he steps off the curb to walk across the street and this car comes around the corner and it's aiming right at him. So he moves into the next lane and the car moves into the next lane and he moves back to the other lane. The car turns back into that lane and as he doesn't know what to do, he just freezes and the car screeches to a halt right next to him and rolls down the window and it's a squirrel saying, you know, it's not as easy as it looks. Sometimes it's not as easy as just saying, Lord, forgive me. You know, our our emotions and our identity and our calling, our, our relationship with Jesus has been damaged by our failing Him. It's not as easy to forgive yourself. We tend to punish ourselves over and over. You know that experience when... Things are going wrong in your life and you immediately think, the Lord's punishing me for that thing that I did years ago. Uh, He forgave it. He forgot it. But you're still carrying it and you're blaming that for new problems that you have going on in your life. Maybe there's somebody here who's chained to a past wrong and you wonder will Jesus ever forgive me what does he think of me I'm a failure you know this one man went to church every Sunday and every Sunday he would come to the altar and cry a bucket of tears and then after the service leave and come back the next Sunday and cry a bucket of tears and every week month after year this was his pattern he wasn't able willing capable of of receiving grace and forgiveness. He he, he couldn't embrace what Jesus had done for him on the cross. Friends, if that's you, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I need you to hear this because you're never going to go forward if you don't hand your sins over to Jesus. It says that he's forgotten them, which means you ask forgiveness one time definitively, and then you move forward. Or are you like me? Oh, Lord, forgive me for this. And you keep going back to it and going back to it. Well, he forgave you the first time. And he's probably saying, okay, you need a little bit of time to process this. I forgive you. But at some point, you have been forgiven And now you're in neutral when you ought to be going forward. How many of us need to hit the stop button, get off the merry-go-round of replaying the past? You can't undo that statement you made. You can't redo the, the action you did. Put it to rest because Jesus has. 
And it's time to move forward as a Christian. And I was reading about this one college coach. He was faced with the possibility of his star athlete not being able to play in the big game because he wasn't doing well in chemistry. So the, the coach goes to the chemistry professor and says, you know, can't you pass him? And the professor says, I'll tell you what, bring him in. I'll ask him a question. If he answers it right, I'll pass him. So they bring the athlete in, and the professor says, <clears throat> what's H2O? The player says, water. And, and frantically, the coach cries out, give him another chance. <laughs> we all need another chance. And that's what's amazing about grace. It's a never-ending second chance to get right with God. And I want you to hear that. The reason that it is in existence, God's grace, is to give you an opportunity to get in that right place with the Lord Jesus. Okay, it's not a free pass to sin. It's an opportunity to say, okay, I, 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 I have another moment to, to, to be right with my Lord. Friends, hear me. Restoration is the cornerstone of Christianity. And Jesus has restored you because of what he did for you on the cross. He takes our failures and makes successes out of them. And with Peter, he's the one who initiates this encounter. He knows what's happening to Peter. He sees him drifting off. And what does he do? He goes and meets him. This, I, this restoring activity, is, it's, it's Jesus' idea. Peter's going back to what he knows. He failed at being a follower of Christ, so he's going back to being a, a fisherman. And if you ask me, he's failing right now. Doesn't catch any fish. They fished all night, caught nothing. And, and what's going on here is huge because basically what Jesus is doing is taking him back to the exact situation in Luke chapter 5. You might recall when they caught a large number of fish, so many that the net started to break. And what does Peter say? Depart from me because I am a sinful man. See, when he started off in his relationship with Jesus, he knew exactly who he was. But somewhere in that journey, he forgot. I'm a sinful man and I'm saved by grace. And so the most important lesson that any of us can learn is being taught to Peter right now. And what's special about this passage, we've, we've talked about this before, there's a charcoal fire that gets presented. And there's only two places where the charcoal fire occurs in the Bible, where Peter denied the Lord and right here. Okay. Where he failed is also going to be where he was restored. You know, when I was in um, Israel, I got to go to this spot where it happened. It's so cool. The Catholics went and put a, a church on every place. If Jesus sneezed, there's a church on it, okay? So you can imagine a place like this, and there's this amazing church. And, and you know, when you sit there and realize what happened, you can't help but get overwhelmed with emotion. This is where Peter the failure got restored to his calling. And... and Basically, Jesus is inviting them to have breakfast. And I want, to make, I want to make a point here. Peter could have refused the invitation. I mean, how many times have you gone to somebody and said, hey, you know what, we have a problem. I'd like to get things restored. And they are unwilling to do it. And the relationship is forever damaged. I see this happen with Christians. Something goes wrong in their life. Maybe a divorce occurred. Maybe they sinned. Somebody sinned against them. And it comes time to get healed. And they won't allow it to happen. And they live at a distance from God the rest of their days. They miss the power of the restoration. And, and you know, sometimes we feel undeserving, unworthy. The biggest obstacle to self-forgiveness is to wallow in self-guilt. Maybe we think it's a form of penance, you know. 
we need to suffer for what we've done. But here's the thing. Jesus said to us, Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Anyone here tonight weary and heavy laden? Might be something that happened to you, and it could be something that you brought upon yourself. He doesn't differentiate. If you're weary and heavy laden, he says, come to me. Let, let yourself rest Amen. under my covering. Now, it's surprising. Uh, Jesus refers to Peter as Simon, son of John. Okay? Uh, Peter doesn't become Peter until later in the, the, the book. When he first meets Peter, Jesus first meets Peter. He's Simon, son of John. And basically, he's taking him back to their first encounter. Back to the beginning of their relationship. You see, Peter's walking away from his calling to be the rock on which I will build my church. And so if you're not going to be the rock, then you're going to be Simon, son of John. Which one do you want to be? Do you want to belong to me? Or do you want to go back to life before we were in relationship? And, and again, this is what's amazing about Jesus. In spite of our failures and denials, our times of disappointing him, breaking his heart, rejecting his love, he still pursues us and wants to have a relationship with us and has done everything needed on the cross so that you can be back in an intimate friendship with him. And this is when Jesus picks on Peter. Peter, do you love me more than these? And we wonder, what does he mean by these? These other disciples, you might recall, Lord, even if all the rest of these guys who follow you fall away, I will not. And Peter did a good job. He swung the sword to protect Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He followed Jesus into the courtyard where it was enemy territory. But he was up against Satan who sifted him like wheat. And Peter denied him. I, I think sometimes we <clears throat> boast about our righteousness. We compare our faith with other people because maybe we don't realize that just underneath the surface is a sinfulness, a struggle, a doubt. Or, or maybe we are aware of that. And we're trying to cover it and hide it. Well, Jesus asked, do you love me more than these? Maybe it's not the other disciples. Maybe he's saying, do you love me more than these fishing equipment? Uh, you know, you're going back to your old life. I wonder if he asked us that question. You know, do we love him more than our job? Our, our money, our toys, our pleasure, our time. What is it that we put ahead of Jesus? I mean, we often tend to love certain people more than Jesus. Maybe there's somebody more important to you than Jesus. You know, our, our, con our, our culture is called um, the, the culture of uh, the idolization of the family. Okay? We idolize the family. You know, I, I can't, if you went up to 50% of the Christians, maybe 75%, what's the most important thing to you? My family and my faith. And they say it that way. And they mean it that way. And I think it's awfully endearing that Jesus is number two, but you have to know something about Jesus. He doesn't want to be number two. And that's what's going on right here in this conversation. You know, is your husband, your wife, your kids, your parents, are you more important than Jesus? Because in Luke 14, he says, unless you hate your father, mother, sister, brother, even yourself, in comparison for your love for me, you can't be my disciples. And everybody gets all upset. Hate? Yeah, it's that extreme. He's above everybody else in your life. And when you put him on, his proper spot, everybody else gets blessed and covered because you have your priorities straight. It's the way it works. This one pastor tells how his dad was a cool guy, but he wasn't a church-going man, and he married a woman who was a church-going woman. 
And soon, he starts to resent her for going to church without him. And he asks her, how can you say you love me if you're going to heaven without me? I don't want you to go to church anymore. She asks, so your love for me is such that you want me to go to hell with you. Ouch. Because you really don't love somebody if you prefer that they go to hell. Changed his whole life around with that one statement. And, and what we have going on with this, this, this interaction between Jesus and Peter, it's, it, the Greek reveals the depth. When Jesus says, do you love me? He's saying, do you agape love me, Peter? Agape is an intense, urgent, committed love. Uh, do you love me the way you said you did back in the um, upper room? And, and Peter can't commit himself to that kind of love. How can I say I do after I failed you? I, I don't trust myself anymore. I, I, I could fail to live up to these standards again. And so he says, I, I phileo love you. I, I like you. You know, the word he uses is fondness, to have affection for. It's a personal attachment. It's a friendship. Do you love me like the number one commitment in your life? You know I like you. It's kind of what's happening. Peter sidesteps the word. It's not because he loves Jesus less, but his pride has been broken. And friends, here's the power of the interchange. Jesus charges Peter, who only likes him, to feed my lambs. Okay? The seriousness of Christ's call to Peter did not change, regardless of how Peter's commitment might have changed. He's still called to care for Christ's flock. And, and Jesus knew Peter would mature in his faith. He was going to die for him upside down on the cross in Rome. And, and I think Jesus knows where we're at. You know, sometimes we are stellar disciples, and other times we're embarrassed to let anybody know we're Christians. You know, when you're driving your car and that person cuts you off and you don't act like a Christian? Then you hope that they don't see the fish on your car? So I had to get rid of the fish off my car, you know? <laughs> you know what? It's, it's one of those things. Some days we're not too good. And sometimes those are seasons of our lives, not just days. But that does not mean you're not a Christian. And that does not mean you shouldn't be talking about your Lord and introducing people to your Lord and trying to get them to go to church and being a Christian. Sometimes we're not very good at it. And, and in whatever it is, on the journey, here's how it works. You're going to fall in love with Jesus and it's going to become agape because at some point you get restored and you're going to see just how beautiful his grace and mercy is. And that's when you fall in love. You know, when Jesus says, do you love me? It's really a personal question for all of us to answer. Imagine if I said, I love my wife, although there are times I prefer not to be with her, and actually I avoid her. I can go days without talking to her. But when I do, I usually talk because I want something from her. I might say something to her right when we're going to have a meal. I confess that when I do talk to her, my mind often wanders as I think about other things. I mean, she's not really part of my every day. I mean, I give her a regular time slot on the weekend. It's a, it's a morning visit. You know, she writes me love letters, but I rarely read them. You know, I'll give her some pocket change, but nothing that cuts into the spending on myself. But, you know, I, I really love her. Now, does it sound like I love my wife? With this description? And is that not how we treat Jesus? I mean, if you treated Jesus, or excuse me, if you treated your spouse the way you treat Jesus, would you stay married very long? <laughs> Fortunately for us, he's made a commitment that he's not willing to break. And he asks us to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and friends, 
Love, it's an action. It's not a feeling. You know, 1 John 3, 18, do not love in word, but in deed and truth. It's one thing to say I love you. That's another thing to show I love you. And love, it's not really about following the rules. Love happens out of a relationship. You know, this one woman married a mean man, and, you know, he didn't like the way she kept the house, did the laundry, ironed the clothes, the cook, she, 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 uh, the food she cooked, the way she dressed, and so he criticized her constantly. And early in the marriage, he gave her a list of 25 things she needed to do to make him happy. And she hated the list, and she began to hate him. And she had to check the list constantly to see if she was pleasing him. And he belittled littled her every time she failed him. He always made her feel small. And then one day, she, he unexpectedly died. And she was freed. And she found another man. And, and they got married and they were enjoying life. And one day she came across the old box from her past life and there was the list from her first marriage and feelings of anger and feelings of inferiority just started to to overwhelm her and and as she read the list she broke out in laughter because she was doing all these things plus a whole bunch more for her new husband and no list was required you see they loved one another it was a relationship built on Love. And, and friends, that's what you have with Jesus. You know, we don't follow a bunch of rules to please God. We couldn't follow the rules. That's why Jesus went to the cross to give us his spirit, his presence, the presence of God, the source of love in you at all times, reminding you how precious you are to him and guiding you to share that with others. And that's when Jesus empowers Peter with the ministry. Even though Peter isn't where he's, not, where he's supposed to be, friends, I'll tell you why. Because Christianity is never really about us. It's about Jesus. When you talk to somebody about the Lord, it's, no, well, let me tell you exactly how. No, let me tell you about the Lord and how amazing he is and how cool he is and how wonderful he is. And you get to talking about him. And people are going to get excited about meeting your Lord. And this Christianity thing, it's not a Lone Ranger uh, proposition. A lot of us, we're like on a secret agent mission. You know, I'm a Christian, but nobody else is going to know about it. It, it. it was never supposed to be that way. You're supposed to talk about your faith. You're supposed to, how to the overflow of your devotional life taking that smile and that positive attitude and going to work or interacting with the people around you. They go, what's up with you? Well, I've been reading the Bible today. And, and they can just tell that that's left a positive imprint upon you. And, and you know what? Maybe you've sinned. Maybe you failed. Maybe you need Jesus. Maybe that's, you're like everybody else on earth. And you don't even have to be a spiritual giant like the Apostle Paul who starts churches everywhere. But the Lord has a job for you to share him, his love, with anybody who crosses your path. You know, I had this gentleman come into my office today, and we prayed, and I anointed him, and it was a really beautiful interchange. And and I, I shared with him, there's three things that I seek to do every day. I try to change the atmosphere wherever I go. Remember that story about Moody? He goes into the barber shop, and feels like there's a worship service going on when he shows up. And he wasn't moralizing. He was just bringing the joy of the Lord. And everybody lingered and wanted to stay there because he made that place a happy place. I want to do that everywhere I go. And the second thing I try to do is I I try to look for that God opportunity. What wasn't said or what was said with a painful tone listening and looking for where I might be able to distribute the presence and power of Jesus. And the third thing came from our Lenten study. How can I show love in this particular situation? Imagine going through every day that way. Do you think the Holy Spirit isn't going to grab a hold of your day and and, and just go to town? Absolutely. And, And I think sometimes we neglect Christ's calling 
Because many of us, we're too busy beating up on ourselves. Oh, I sinned again. I'm not worthy of the Lord. And here's, I think I'm on to you. It's an excuse. You see, if I keep sinning, then I don't have to do my Christianity. I don't have to worry about talking about the Lord because I've disqualified myself. So I get to do my own agenda. And, and, and you know, I get forgiven. And I, I, somebody said this. I thought it was very insightful. They said, if you're unwilling to accept God's forgiveness, it's actually a pride problem. You think you're above what God can do for you. Friends, you're no more special than any other sinner. The grace has been extended to you and for you to say, oh no, I'm unworthy. You know, that's a prideful stance. We're all unworthy and we all live in need of this grace. You know, this one wealthy man, he married a a lovely woman and, you know, he started thinking that, well, first of all, he was an older man and he married a younger woman. He started thinking she married me for my money. So he asked her, You know, if I lost all my money, would you still love me? And she responded reassuringly, Oh, don't be silly. Of course I would still love you. And I would miss you terribly. (laughs) You know, we put conditions on love that Jesus doesn't. He takes you, failures and flaws, everything about you. You belong to him. There's nothing you can do to lose his love. Peter denied knowing Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He pursued his fallen disciple. Because your failure, it's not final. And Jesus sees beyond our mistakes. He knows our hearts. He knows you have a deep affection for him. And, And friends, hear me. Romans 11.29, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. You can't be disqualified. You just get restored and put back into action. That's what it is. And, and I, you know, what causes us to step into that calling? Is it not the relationship that's based on our need for his forgiveness? That's why we're called. Because we embrace his forgiveness. And why is it extended to us? Because he loves us. All right? Remember that story where the Pharisee and Jesus are chatting in in his house and the woman breaks in and starts crying all over his feet and using her hair to to wash his, dry his feet from her tears. And the Pharisee's thinking, oh, this guy was a real religious person. He'd know that that woman's a sinner. And, and, And Jesus has this conversation and he says, he who is forgiven little loves little. And he who is forgiven much loves much. And and we immediately go into, okay, how much do I need to be forgiven? No. All of us have a large portion of need to be forgiven. Okay? Let's take the prodigal son and the older brother. Who needed it more? Both needed it a lot. Okay? Okay? And here's what I want you to hear me. We stand in need of a lot of forgiveness. And maybe it's just that some don't want it, some reject it, some put it off till another day until that love diminishes enough to where it doesn't matter anymore. And love, it comes from God moving in you. That's when we really love. You know, I might love somebody because they do something for me. That's selfish love. But God's love is when you go out and you see an opportunity, you see somebody hurting, you pray, you bring your resources, you care about it, you network to fix it, you build the the new facility, you, you, you go down to 192 and care for broken people, you do something with your faith because it's God moving inside of you. You know, Peter, he's called to feed the lambs and sheep. These are new converts and mature believers. And, and I found this new fact. 153 large fish were in the net. Do you know that there's supposed to be 153 different fish in the Sea of Galilee? So what he's saying is that Christ's death on the cross 
It means salvation was given to everybody. And that's the calling Peter was given. We're called to share the love of Jesus with everybody. And I'm going to ask a really difficult question. Are you sharing the love of Jesus with anybody? You know, a couple sermons ago, I mentioned that 96% of Christians have never shared their faith with anybody. Or was it 94%? 96% of Christian parents have never shared their testimony with their children. Wow. Think about that. Are you sharing your faith with anybody? You know, too many Christians, we're, we're no longer fishers of men. We're keepers of the aquarium. And we're supposed to be fishers of men. In Ezekiel 487.10 Fishermen will stand along the shore, and the fish will be of many kinds. 153, maybe? Jeremiah 16, 6. But now I will send my fishermen, and they will catch them. What's Peter supposed to be doing? Fishing for men. And that's why Jesus is on him. Do you love me? Because he wants to know if I'm still going to be a priority in your life. And here's where it gets personal. Is Jesus a priority in your life? I was reading about Napoleon's soldiers. Their devotion to him was amazing. If they were dying on the battlefield and they saw him coming by, they would get up on one elbow and, and yell out, Viva Emperor! One guy was dying. And, and, and the, the, no, not dying, he, he had a bullet in his chest. And the doctor's trying to get it out. And he says, if you go any deeper, you're going to find the emperor. Who's down in your heart? Who's, who's at the core of your life? Is it Jesus? Well, I got a whole bunch more sermon. Um, this one old American Indian, he went to church, and the preacher was doing a lot of shouting and pulpit pounding. But he wasn't really bringing any content. And so after the service, somebody asked the Indian, hey, uh, what'd you think of the sermon? And the Indian said, high wind, big thunder, no rain. <laughs> In other words, it's easy to talk about our love for Jesus and not take it anywhere. And I want to ask, in this generation... If we don't pass on our faith, there's not going to be Christianity in the next generation. And right now, the baton of faith is in our hands. And it's time for us to, to pass it on to the next generation. And, and that's why we're trying to build this building. And that's why I'm always leaning on you to, to talk to the people in your personal life about your faith. I'm not asking you to be on a street corner. I'm just saying talk to the people in your life about the most important person to your heart. Let's rise up with the Spirit of Jesus Christ leading us and start talking and building the kingdom and passing on our faith. Your sins, a non-issue. Jesus took care of them and he's come to remind you, you belong to me, there's nothing that you can do to break that relationship. Lord, what a joy to be here tonight. How exciting to know that you're that God, the hound of heaven that comes pursuing us. And as we get ready to take communion for anybody who wants to, uh, would you restore that fervent relationship? And if our love is lacking... Would you come alive in us and remind us how much you care about us and what you've done for us? And Lord, even if we're cold as a stone, show us opportunities to tell people about you because we know the moment we start that conversation, our faith is going to come alive and we're going to fall in love with you all over again. 
In the name above all names, the name of Jesus Christ.